Howdy, howdy, y'all. Welcome back to Semantics. It is another Tuesday, an another day talking about building great user experiences for the web. Um, today, I am joined by Chance Strickland. Chance, hello. Welcome back to the stream. Ben, always great to be here. Always Welcome great to have you with on. You. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And before we dive in, I do. Uh, I want to thank Michael Chan for resubscribing. I want to thank Jason for the 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 raid. Thank you so much. That is um, that is awesome. Welcome everyone. If you're unfamiliar, Semantics is a weekly Twitch stream where I bring on guests from around uh, around the web dev industry, and we talk about um, you know building great user experiences with the web. Um, you with a focus on accessibility and core web technologies. So if you're coming from Learn with Jason, the format should probably be fairly familiar, just with a focus on like that accessibility and core web tech. Um, so yeah, uh, before we dive into what we're doing today, um, in case folks haven't seen you around, Chance, um, would you like to just kind of introduce yourself a bit? Uh, sure. Yeah. So my name is Chance the Dev on Twitter or uh, Chance the Dev anywhere. I I guess my legal name is Chance Strickland, but nobody ever remembers that. So I like Chance the Dev. Uh, it's nice and nice and snappy. But I work for Remix. If you don't know about Remix, Remix is a React framework we just open sourced and released to the public a few months ago, and uh, we're at version 1.1.1 right now. Make a wish. So. Um, we're really excited about Remix. Uh, Remix is also really focused on web foundations, web fundamentals. So I think it makes uh, a great pairing for this podcast. And I'm really excited to dive into how uh, some of how so Remix's APIs and how we think we enable you to make better websites. So really excited about this. Awesome. Uh, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And um, if you aren't already following Chance on Twitter, you absolutely should um, at Chance the Dev. Um, and then we're going to be, uh, uh, we are going to be talking about Remix, and you can find out more about Remix at uh, Remix.run. Um, excellent, yeah. Uh, cool, so let's go ahead and, I guess, just kind of dive in. So um, I, you sent me a repo ahead of time, and I had to do uh, some setup type things. Um, this repo will be available later, but my understanding is it's not quite ready to start like just dropping links places. But uh, yeah, so yeah. just for for everyone's reference, um, I've already apologized a million times to Ben, but um, my life is is uh, I, I would describe nothing short of chaos at the moment. I've got um, just like lots of externalities that are just. Um, I, 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 let's just say I have not made as much uh, progress on this, this code as I'd like to, um, but that's okay. We're going to do it live and we're going to uh, still explore all the important things, but eventually, and by eventually, I mean, hopefully this week we'll uh, get everything cleaned up and, and published so that we have a, a solid foundation for, for sharing with everyone. Alex, thank you for the, the sub. Uh, super appreciate it. Yeah, so um, I had to do a few setup things. These are environment variable things because we're going to be doing some database stuff. But uh, besides that, I have not really had the chance to do anything with this code base. But just um, I guess this caveat of we are working with um, some scaffolding that's already been built out mainly so that things like database connections and styles, um, stuff that's not really today's focus, um, just so that that stuff can be squared away ahead of time. So yeah yep so and to build on that too um so what i wanted to do for this stream I, I know a lot of streams you'll build these these small little things which makes sense because you've got what an hour hour and a half to to get through something and it's like you can't build a production app in an hour and a half you're just not going to do that so like what i've got here what I'm, what I'm hoping to have here is a really solid starter to what would ultimately be a production ready app and we're not going to build the whole thing in an hour, an hour and a half. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take a project that's already set up and we're going to just walk through some of the code and explain what's happening and try and explain some of Remix's fundamentals that way. And then uh, when we get to the end of that process, what we'll do is we'll add a couple of new features that will um, also help us understand some of Remix's core features. All right. Cool. So uh, where should we start? Should we be diving into the code or should we pull up this project? Like, um, should we be talking about what... Uh, Remix even is in the first place. Yeah, so so Remix at its core is a React server-side uh, rendered React framework. Um, if you are familiar with frameworks like Next.js, um, it, it's similar in a sense, but 
also not really. It's uh, I would say it's more it's more comparable to full featured web frameworks. Like if if you're a Ruby dev, you might come from Rails. If you're a PHP dev, like myself, you might come from Laravel. Um, these full featured server uh, web framework, these full stack web frameworks, to really help you bootstrap a server side rendered application um, really quickly and efficiently, and provide a solid user experience. So that's at its core what what Remix is trying to be, and what I think we we are. And so um, yeah, if we get started here, um, the first thing you'll do if you're working in any JavaScript project is go ahead and install your dependencies, which I believe you've already done. Yeah. But um, just pretend like we're starting from complete scratch and go ahead and run npm install. Yep. And we've got a couple of dependencies um, that are, are going to help our dev process a little bit. Uh, we're going to run npm run dev as well. It's just going to start up our web server using pm2. pm2, for those who don't know, is a process manager. Uh, manages It allows you to run multiple processes apparently uh, with some added configuration options if you're used to running the currently NPM package is sort of similar, but a little bit more full featured. Um, so we're going to be running a few processes simultaneously. Uh, unlike some other tools that you might be used to in the React ecosystem, uh, Remix sort of pulls back a little bit on some of the, the build tooling abstractions. So we don't we don't bundle your styles automatically. We don't um, we, we don't abstract any of that stuff. We, we expose that directly to the user. So you can handle uh, compiling all your styles with whatever tooling you want. You want to use SAS, you can run SAS. You want to use Post CSS, you can run Post CSS. If you just want to load some plain old CSS uh, style sheets, you can totally do that too. Uh, what we're doing here is we're running a process that's going to compile all of our uh, a lot of our styles uh, using Post CSS, so that we don't have to worry so much about modern syntax and that kind of thing. But other than that, it's a pretty pretty light process here. And we're also going to run our server as well on a separate process. So we're running an Express server on one process the Remix dev server in another, and our CSS processing on another. And that's what we're doing now. So if you want to open up localhost port 3000, we will, in a browser, sorry. Yep. Yeah, uh, we will see our application. All right. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been following. Uh, Jay Feli Webb, Grumpy, thank you for following. Ben, thank you for the sub. Uh, and I see a few people. Uh, talking about our, our sweaters. I actually do want to highlight our sweater. I have to like kind of stand up for this. Um, I am wearing a T-Rex sweater. The T-Rex is wearing the same sweater. If you look carefully, you can see that uh, the T-Rex's little claws are poking through the sleeves. So uh, just so you know, Christmas isn't just the brand today. We're still going all in on T-Rex Christmas. So um, just had to do that. Um, yeah, and I'm actually feeling a little left out because I, I scrambled to find this hat but I have a I have a sweater I really love and I just can't find it. But it's a it's a green Christmas sweater with the leg lamp from a Christmas story on it. And it's like my favorite thing ever. And tragically, you'll just have to imagine it in your head and pretend that I look way cooler than I do. But right now Ben has got me on the Christmas game. Uh Bob, thank you for the sub. Yeah, so uh and also T Rexmas, I think that is the official uh name for, for this event. We are celebrating <laughs> T Rexmas. Um yeah. Uh, cool. So I've got this little sign in form. Um, I don't currently have an account. Um, so yeah. So before we talk about the sign in form, let's just talk about what just happened, right? Like you went to localhost 3000, um, and then it sent you to this sign in form. How do we, how do we do that? So what, what's actually happening? So if we go into our, uh, go back into VS code for a moment. Let's, let's just walk around a bit. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing that we want to note here is that remix, uh, there, Remix works by various conventions. And one of the conventions that we use is we have this app directory. And if you open up the app directory, um, just like its name suggests, this is sort of where all of your app code lives. Um, so right off the bat, when we run, when we open this, uh, open this URL in the browser, what's actually happening? So we have this entry server file and this entry client file. And as they might suggest, these are sort of the entry points for both our client and our server code. Um, the server, as you might guess, is our server. It's just a plain old express server, and it handles all the routing. It handles everything that a, ser a server would normally handle. And there is a light uh, remix wrapper for handling the all of the requests to our server. And it's pretty straightforward, but the, the client code is where we hydrate our app. Um, so if, if, if you're used to working in a React app, 
React is, if you're rendering it on the server, you're going to render it once on the server with some of React DOM server methods, and then you're going to hydrate it in the client, which essentially just means React is going to go through and React DOM is going to go through and map the server code to your client code and then start running all of the effects and, and doing all of the things that we love uh, for really fancy client side transitions and everything, right? Um, and so think of those as our entry points. Our root.tsx is sort of the root route or root root if you're from one of those weird countries that pronounces those two words the same. Uh, our root route is, um, it's it's our root, it's what it suggests, right? This is This is what we load when we first open up our website and it's responsible, responsible for rendering everything. So let's let's explore that. We've got this document component, and we've got a few things that you might notice. First of all, it's just an HTML doc. That's all it is. There's no abstraction of that. It's just HTML, your head, your body, and that's it, right? Now we've got some, we've got a little bit of abstractions here, right? We've got uh, we've got this meta component. We've got this links component. These components are responsible for rendering the individual routes, meta, and links functions. And we'll talk about all of those things uh, later on as well. But those are ultimately going to generate the meta tags and the links tags for each of our individual routes. Now, instead of our body, we've got uh, we've got our children, and we're, we're using this component as our layout. We'll see where that uh, is rendered in a, in a few minutes. But we've got this script that is essentially just injecting some client-safe environment variables from our server. Uh, you, you might note that you can't call process.env on the on the client, which is a good thing because we've got some sensitive information in there usually, like secrets and whatnot. So we do want some things on the client perhaps. So we, we assign this uh, in global variable to the client. So uh, we've got the scroll restoration component that comes from Remix and handles um, scroll restoration between uh, navigation. So if you are normally working the client side app, one of the, the headaches is that if you handle client, when you're dealing with client side routing, a lot of times you lose your scroll position when you change okay. routes. Um, that's what scroll restoration does for us. We've also got this uh, scripts component. And what this does is this is what ultimately loads React in the client. And this is actually one of the cool things, one of the coolest things I think about Remix is that if you don't want to load any React on the client, let's say you just really love writing all of your apps in React. You really love JSX. You love uh, the JavaScript experience, but you really don't need all that extra bundle size, right? Yeah. Maybe you're not actually using any state. Maybe there are no effects in your app, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need React at all on the client. We can remove all of React from the client by simply deleting the scripts component, and we will never, ever have React in our bundle. Um, and that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, we can drastically reduce the size of our, our bundles in, in the client if we don't if we don't use any of React's client-side features. Um, now we're going to in this application, so we're going to keep that. Um, but I just think that's a nifty little thing we can do. Um, and since everything is running in the server anyway, um, the routing is still going to work even if that scripts hasn't fully loaded yet and we haven't actually hydrated the client yet. So um, now if we go down to our application or app component, we can see we're, we're calling a few things. We're calling this use loader data. What the heck is that thing? Yeah. Uh, use loader data is a hook that comes from Remix. And it is what's responsible for getting data that is loaded on the server via the loader function, which we'll jump up to in a minute. Now it's getting this object back and it has this end variable. We're getting that from our server, passing it to the client and passing it into our document, which is going to assign that global variable, right? And then we're rendering this outlet to the child. Outlet is a component that uh, it comes from Remix, but it actually comes from React Router under the hood. It's a light abstraction on the React Router 6 outlet component. And this is responsible for rendering the route that we're currently looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So think of the outlet as whatever route we're currently on, that's rendered by the outlet. So this handles all of our routes. Okay. Um, then we get this catch boundary thing. That's a catch boundary. So if our server throws an error and we catch that error on, and, and handle it uh, specifically based on the, the status code here, we can return a different error message based on whichever status that we got. So if we uh, return a, a, a response that has one of these status codes, we can render a specialty error page for that status code. Okay. We've also got this error boundary component. You can think of the error boundary component as any error that is thrown on the server that we just forgot to handle, right? Any uh-oh page or like, what the heck happened? We don't know. We forgot to handle that. So all of that stuff, if you throw any error on the server and we haven't handled it uh, anywhere in our, uh, in our code, it's going to end up in the error boundary. So just to make sure I'm understanding properly, everything that we're seeing in this root.tsx 
this is the scaffolding for an entire uh, applications interface. So like all of the pages ultimately sift through this logic. So we only have to write it once. We're not writing this for a bunch of different pages. Not quite, but almost. So okay. that is technically correct. You can get away with only having this and you would still have your app. Now it's not going to be super useful because you need routes in your application, sure. right? Um, but so the, the conventions like the catch boundary and the error boundary, the way that this these conventions work is that they're handled by the root. But if you if you do export an error boundary or a catch boundary in a specific route and you are on that route, it's going oh. to basically bubble up until you hit the first boundary that you find. Okay. So that's, you can think of that as like the boundary for handling those errors. So, so if we, we have one at the root, okay. we handle it there. But if we don't have if we don't have one in a specific route, then it just bubbles up until it gets to the root and it bubbles up through the route tree. Interesting. And we'll talk more about the route tree and nested routes and all that stuff here in a bit. But um, yeah, essentially, each you can, the root is an example of what a, any route component technically could look like. We can have a loader, uh, we can have meta, we can have links. So if you scroll to the top of the uh, the top of the file, we can talk a little bit about some other conventions here. Now I mentioned the the links. Uh, we talked about rendering that links component. That's rendering all of the link tags from our route. If we export a function called links, it returns an array of objects that is going to map to our link tags and the link tag attributes, right? So okay. right now we are loading a style, uh, the style sheet. This is our global style sheet and we're loading it in root because it's global and we want it to load everywhere. Any links that we render in the root, we're going to render all throughout our application. We can also load, uh, or we can also export links on individual routes and they are only loaded on those routes, mm. which is really great for styling because we don't have to worry as much about uh, class name clashes that we may have in other okay. uh, in other styling mechanisms where you're loading uh, potentially conflicting class names, right? So one of the biggest reasons people reach for tools like CSS modules is to avoid these clashes, right? Uh, it's much less likely if you're loading style sheet links in your individual routes, right? Because you you know what you're rendering in that route. Uh, so you have a lot of a lot of control here. Uh, based on exporting individual links, uh, depending on which route you, you happen to be on. And those uh, link components, those link tags will be added and removed to the DOM as you navigate. Okay. Uh, the loader that we see below this is, uh, and for those who are not familiar with TypeScript, I, I just realized that we might have some folks who are seeing some of these types and getting a little confused. Uh, the loader function, uh, this syntax is the export let loader colon loader function thing. This is just giving us the types for our, the function that we're exporting. It's a definition for our, our loader type. And the loader function is an asynchronous function. This is only called on the server. And this is where we get that loader data from. When we call the use loader data hook in our route, we get it based on the return value from our loader. So we see in our loader function, we are returning this object with an nth key that has our site URL uh, from the server. Okay. So now we, we're, we're returning that data from the loader. When we call use loader data in the route component, we have access to that data directly. That makes sense? I think so. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces that kind of fit together, but I'm starting to see how, um, yeah, how, how this is fitting together. So this, this loader, this is how we get information from the server to the client logic. That's exactly right. So anytime you need to get something from the server over to the client, you only want to handle them on the server, um, so that's what the loader's for. And this is actually a really powerful function because what we normally do when we're building React applications, if we need to go fetch something from the server, is we've got this, this component rendering sitting around in our application uh, on the client, and it doesn't have any data yet. We render it before we ever have any data, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, how do you get that data? Well, normally you, would, you, you might use some sort of data wrapper, like uh, you know, use a React query, right? Or... Um, What's the uh, the first cell one? SWR, I think it is. Think um, so. Yeah, there, there's a bunch of different libraries that people have used to abstract the fetch API. But essentially, we just rely on the web standard. We let you fetch data directly on your server, return it, and by the time it's rendered in the client, we've already got it on the server. You don't have to do any of that stuff, right? There's no loading spinners. There's no um, set some state after use effect and you know waiting for stuff to load. It's just there, right? And if you have a fast server and you use caching, you can get that data really quick and have a really snappy app with fewer loader spinners, which is pretty cool. And we'll see some of that in action as we as we keep going forward. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, now that I've uh, explained away the root file, uh, we can go back to our browser and see that um, we are sitting on a sign-in page. But we didn't go to the sign-in route, but the URL says we're on the sign-in route. We just went to the index. Let's go back to our code for a moment. Let's talk about how we got here. Yeah. So if we look in our routes directory inside of our app directory, this is another convention in Remix. Uh, the routes directory, as it suggests, is where all of our route files live. This is how Remix knows what to route to our URL, uh, from our URL. So from those requests, we end up rendering these specific um, components based on that outlet we saw in the root, right? So our index route, um, so let me back up. Whatever you, your default export from a route file is the component that you render when you see that route. Now, in our index route here, we aren't actually exporting a default component. We're not exporting a component at all. There's nothing here except this loader function. It's purely the server-side logic. Yeah, so you can think of routes that don't have a component, you can think of as request handlers. They're essentially just request handlers. So your loader is what is returned to you when you make a get request to this endpoint, to that URL. So if I uh, request this URL in the browser, we're going to execute this loader logic on our server. And then the response that we get is what is handled by our browser. So you see in the loader, what we're doing is we're calling this get user function. Uh, get user is just a, an abstraction that is essentially getting some session data, right? When we, when we sign up for the uh, sign up for a new account or we log in, we're going to establish the session on the server. Uh, and then we're going to check the server to see if we have an active session. If we do, we're going to redirect you to that user's dashboard. If we don't, we're going to redirect you to the sign-in page. And that's how we get to the sign-in page in the browser. OK. So now, since we are redirecting to sign-in, as you might imagine, sign-in is adjacent to the index.tsx file. We've got the sign-in file. This is our sign-in route. And this is what we see in the browser. OK. So we're importing a bunch of components and tools, but we're exporting a few things, too. We're exporting this meta function. So our meta function is similar to our links in that it returns uh, in this case, it returns an object, and the object uh, has a key value pair. You can uh, return a title. You can also return um, meta descriptions. You can return OG tags, anything that would ordinarily render a meta tag in HTML. It just follows the um, similar conventions. I'm pretty sure OG tags are the only type of meta tags that don't use the uh, title and I think it's title content. I always forget. Yeah, like it's, title um, I was actually just looking this up yesterday uh, for some side projects that I was working on. Um, OG tags use the attribute property. And yeah, that's content, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas most other meta tags expect it to be like meta name uh, for the name of the property it's it's yeah weirdly I, I, confusing when's the last time you actually wrote a real meta tag in html i couldn't tell you so I mean, like i live in 11 so yeah. yesterday okay <laughs> fair enough uh, i well for me like i don't know i before i was a react developer as a wordpress developer so we just used like yoast seo and all that stuff so sure. i don't know i don't touch meta tags anymore so i'm a little rusty but um it's nice because Remix actually teaches you a lot of things you forgot. You know, like you, yeah. you can only hold so much information in your head as a developer. I think at least I can. I just I chuck stuff away in the mem in the deep recesses of my mind, and then it, it just goes away. So I've I've relearned a lot of web uh, fundamentals just by uh, building on and, and using Remix. So Makes anyway, uh, this so this route we're exporting some meta, we're exporting some links. Um, this link we're just exporting a style sheet for this specific route. We're exporting this action thing. What the heck is an action? We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, gonna just hide just you flash that. that. Yeah. We got our loader. We know what our loader does. So um, loader is going to uh, check to see if we are if we have a user. So if we hit this route, but we're already logged in. If you hit the sign-in route and you're already logged in, then there's no reason to log in again. So it's just going to, same thing as our index route, it's going to redirect you to your dashboard if you have a user. Makes sense. Um, and then we've got, we're exporting our default sign-in component. And this is where our rendering actually happens, right? So we've got a few things going on. We've got uh, this action data thing, which, as you might imagine, comes from that action function we looked at before. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, we're pulling some things off of our, our action data. We've got this use search param. So if this is coming from React Router as well. Uh, it's actually, we're importing it from Remix, but it's a React Router feature. Remix, if you don't know, 
um, is a it's built on a React router uh, to handle all of its routing. So React router version six is really the powerhouse behind a lot of Remix's core functionality. Um, and then we've got this form ref, and we've got this hook that I that I wrote to help us do some focus management. I love that this is an accessibility focused podcast because I've tried to build a um, I've tried to build a, a really accessible application here. There's still some things I need to to work on and improve, but um, we we've got uh, some decent focus management going on on each route, which I'm um, really excited about. So this is going to help us if we have an error uh, in our form, it's going to refocus the first form field that has an error. Okay. Um, which is, I believe, what the ARIA folks recommend us, or the W3C recommends that we do. Um, and then we're just rendering some components after that. We're rendering the sign-in form. And that's kind of that's kind of it. So let's let's talk about our action again. Yeah. Uh, so let me expand what the this. heck is an action? So if a if a loader function is handling our GET request. Our action handles any other type of request. So okay. if you're doing any sort of mutation, uh, any post, put, patch, any other type of uh, request, um, it's going to be calling your action if you export mm. that from, from that component. If you don't export it, nothing happens. But essentially, we call this action, or we, we make a, a post request, and we're going to call this action function. Okay. So how do we make this post request? How do we actually sign in? So when we sign in, we want to make a post request. We are posting to our server. We, we're sending it some credentials and we're saying, hey, server, deal with these credentials, right? Uh, we want to handle all that stuff on the server. We don't want no weird client side stuff happening with handling sensitive information. So what we're going to do is if you take a look at our component again, we are ultimately rendering, we're looking for a form. Like the so form. Yeah, that is capital form though. What is that capital form? That suggests we're dealing with a custom form component. Well, this is an import that we get from Remix as well. Remix exports his own form. Um, it, it acts a lot like the native form in HTML. It handles your requests. Um, it has the exact same API that you're used to if you know how to use HTML forms. Uh, the difference is, is that we, we can not only handle the form. So a traditional form, uh, a plain HTML form, is going to send a request to the server and then do a full refresh of your page because you're changing routes when you post a form action, uh, or you're potentially changing routes, but it's always going to refresh uh, the page, right? Mm -hmm. But when we're using React Router and we want we want to preserve some of the functionality of React Router and handle those, those client-side transitions, maybe we've got some page transitions, right? Maybe we've got some, some transitions happening when data comes back. Um, the Remix form gives us that ability. So we, we can still post to a form the same way we can using plain old HTML. Um, but the beauty of this is that if the user's JavaScript hasn't completely loaded yet and they submit this form before their JavaScript has had, not, has had a chance to run, say they're on a really slow connection, mm -hmm. um, they'll just fall back to a plain old HTML form and it still works, right? It's a progressive enhancement, essentially. You don't get the um, nice but, transition. Yeah. You, you don't get the, like, oh, everything doesn't jump around or whatever. Like, uh, you don't get that, but, like, it's still functional. It still works behind the yep. scenes. And, yeah. Just yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is a progressive, yeah, exactly. This is a progressively enhanced form, and we are going to send a post request when this form is submitted. Um, and once we do, since we don't, if you're not familiar with the form API in HTML, since we don't post to a specific action, the default action is the route you're currently on, right? Okay. So we can post to different routes. We could post to another route somewhere else in our route hierarchy, or we can post to this current route. And since we don't have a specific action, we default to the current route. So this form is going to be handled in our action function. Okay. And and so if it posts to itself, does that um, then mean that, because we've got the, like, the, the redirect where, like, if you do have a user, um, it'll mm -hmm. take you to the dashboard. So it's basically hoping, like, it, re it posts to itself so it would reload itself and then hoping that the redirect catches it. Well, again, the loader is is executed by GET requests, right? We're making mm. a POST request. So we, we've already checked for the user once we hit the route. But right now, we're, we're making a POST, so we're, gonna, we're uh, going to call our action function. Okay. So we're looking at a different function here. So if we, we take a look at the action, this is basically where we start handling all that data that just came from our form, right? Gotcha. So first thing we do is we await the, the form data uh, that comes from the request. This is just the standard 
uh, web standard request object. And uh, you can call dot form data. This is an asynchronous function. And once we have that, this is essentially an object full of all of the fields that were in our form that was submitted, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we go ahead and call form data dot get on the various fields that we have. We've got this email, this password, and our redirect location once we're logged in. And now we have the data. We've got all of our data that we need to work with. Now what we're doing is we're just going to validate that data. Right? You always want to validate your data on the server. You, want to, you might want to validate in the client too. For, for most folks who are in the React space, you might be used to libraries like Formic, right? That you, you know, build these really nice fancy client side forms. Um, we, and folks use various libraries for validation uh, on the client of those forms. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, the client also has, the browser has really great built-in validation as well that we can rely on or we can handle client side validation, but that's not always enough, right? Because a really savvy user can get around that. Um, so we want to validate that stuff on the server too and send a correct response if we have invalid data, right? Um, so we're going to invalidate all of those fields. So most of this logic is just validating, checking that we've got the right type of, of content here. And then once we finally validate all that, we've got the, the data that we need, we're going to start handling the login process. So we're still validating right now. We can keep going down. We uh, we're go. setting up some errors. We're returning those errors if we have any. Uh, we're returning this JSON function. What, what the heck is JSON? JSON is also uh, something we get from Remix, and it is going to wrap our return value and return some data, but also a response for that data. So again, HTTP status codes. This is a 401 response, which I believe is just in like an invalid thing. I can't remember. I, I have to like always look at MDN for the response yeah. codes, but. Um, anything in the 400s is always uh, it's always bad. So we're returning a, a bad response here with our errors so that we can take those errors in the server or in the client rather and um, and render them, right? So that's where that use action data hook comes from. But once we've validated everything and we know we're, that we're logging in, we're going to call this create user session function that is going to redirect us to the dashboard once we've successfully logged in. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. There's a lot going on, but yes, it, it makes, <laughs> sense. makes so, sense. So, um, yeah, no, there is a lot going on. There's a lot to explain. Um, I think once we start seeing this over and over in our different routes, it starts to, eventually it starts to click. Uh, I hope, you know, and once it does, um, I don't know, for me, like I, these conventions make, make building these kinds of apps so much more productive for me. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, really happy with it. So anyway, uh, this is our sign-in page, right? That's everything that's happening as we <laughs> sign into our, our application. It's quite a lot. And there's still a few abstractions that we've got here that we, we don't really have time to get into. But um, all, everything in our action, just like everything in our loader, is only ever called in the server. Another really cool thing about Remix is that it automatically splits all that stuff out for you. So even though all of that code is in the same file, your action and your loader, all the, the code that is related to your action loader are all split out of your ultimate client bundle. Uh, our our compiler does all that for you. So you don't have to worry about any of this action or loader code uh, junking up your client bundle, which is really nice. Good deal. <sighs> Man. That's a lot. I'm, yeah. I'm out of breath. So much for, um, for, for just one page, but it, it really does <laughs> yeah. show how this stuff is all fitting together. So thank you. Yeah, of course. And so with that said, let's go to another page. Do it again. So yeah. we, we can't sign in yet because we have we don't even have a user account, do we? Right. No, I haven't created so, one yet. Why don't we? Why don't we do that? See that? Yeah. Register here. Let's click that. So now we're on the register route. Let's go ahead and fill that out. And then put in a, a dummy password here. And then, oh look at that. Oh man, what happened? Um, passwords must contain at least one fetch So Let's check out this route file next. Take a look at our register file. Okay. So in our register file, it's going to look very similar to our sign-in file. We've got a meta function that exports some, some meta about our page. We've got this links function. Uh, we got a loader that appears to be completely content, uh, commented out for some reason. I don't know if that's, uh, well, I don't worry about that. Like I said, this is mostly, this app is in, uh, in development. So uh, we'll worry about that little guy. Uh, let's take a look at our action. So just like our sign-in form, our action form, it's going to get all of our form data. It's going to validate that form data. And then it's going to return some data for like based on what happened, right? Or it's going to redirect us after we've successfully created a user. Um, and we, we note here that we've got some error, this field errors object. 
Um, we've got this validate email function. Um, that validate email function um, is going to have all the logic necessary to validate that that's a, a correct email before we start serving it, right? Um, we got the validate password function, right? And this is what's caching your, your password problem, right? Passwords must be at least six characters long. Password must contain at least one special character. We could add any other validation or special rules that we want for our passwords. Um, but I just wanted to, to show you how that validation is happening on the server, not on the client. Because again, if, if you have a savvy user who can open up dev tools, you can get around client validation. Um, so this is all happening on the server. We return that data to the client so that you can see that error with the use action data hook. So if we have that action data, then we're going to get those objects in our route component. Okay, so um, yeah, so we call use action data. We, we get those field errors. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, just don't do anything. Um, this is a use effect, but we don't do anything if there's no errors whatsoever. Yeah, this this is actually, some, um, this is what that abstracted uh, focus management hook that I showed you in the last oh. route was was actually doing. Got it. Um, so th this is searching, this is a use effect. So this is happening on the client. Um, and this is just because we, again, we have to deal with client side routing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we want to do when we reroute on the client or when we get, when any of our form errors change is we want to focus that first form field. Gotcha. Um, so uh, you, you don't have to go through the nuts and bolts of this, but that's ultimately yeah. what it's doing. It's but checking to see if we have any form errors and then focusing the first field that it finds with an error. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but, but one thing you will notice, one thing that I notice about this route, there's not a single use state. There's no state in this route, but we do have state in this route, right? We've got, error state we've okay. got the the validation state right we've got some state but it's all handled by our server and it's just returned to us as soon as we load that route but we don't have to call use state we don't have to do any fancy uh, data fetching in the component itself we don't have to juggle the effects or anything like that we've just handled it on our server and it comes to us as soon as we get that data back so then in that case do you have you found that there's like ever a use case for using something like use state in a remake oh, yeah. application? Okay. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see some later on. Cool. Um, there there is certainly a use case for use state. Um, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit later on about um, optimistic UI. And with optimistic UI, anytime you've got an optimistic UI, you're going to, generally speaking, you're going to have some some sort of state somewhere, um, just to hold like the temporary state the temporary state in memory while we're waiting on that state to come back from the server right so there there are situations where you certainly need some state in your okay uh, in, in your route components but um i i find at least when i'm building remix routes like using remix for me is in some of my uh some of the apps that i've refactored has eliminated like 80 percent of my use states and use effects interesting and you just the stuff that you do use it for is mostly progressive enhancement okay yeah, so that's what we're looking at here. That's what happens when you register for users. So let's go back and uh, check out our browser. Let's fix that busted password. Try again. There we go. Okay. And here we go. We have signed in to our application. Um, again, I have not spent a ton of time styling this thing, so it's not you know it's not pretty yet. Um, but it, you know, it, the layout works all right. So we've got this uh, this dashboard view, this greeting that says uh, hello. Here's what you missed while you're away. So um, we got, we're building a project management app. So let's take a look and see how some of this stuff works. We've got this, uh, right now we don't have any projects. Let's create a new project. All right. Some anthems, apparently. Yeah. So here's an example where I did use some state. We've got this uh, members field that is only rendered if you actually in, uh, update the project name. Um, and that's just because the project name is required before you can start adding members to your, your project. But if you don't have... Uh, JavaScript enabled for whatever reason, or you you haven't hydrated on the client, that field just doesn't show up. But you can add members later, right? Yeah. So again, progressive enhancement. There's a little state there. Okay. Um, but we don't need to add members because we we actually don't have anybody to add. We've only created one user. If we created more users, we could add some some of those to our project. But we'll just go ahead and create this for now. All right. Uh... And here's our project dashboard. Uh, there's your title, there's your description, there's a list of your users, which is currently only only you. Uh, there's a little drop-down uh, menu button on the right-hand side that 
Um, we've got some the, the ability to edit or delete the project. So we just got some basic CRUD functionality here. There you go, do it well. So when you update, that is going to send a request to our server. Once the form is submitted, the UI in the background um, will only update after that request goes through. It doesn't Did actually press... seem to be doing it. Uh, let me just check the console real quick. Uh, oh, no also actually... we got a bad route. Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I made some changes before sure. the um, before the stream, so I'll go back and fix that. But good note, I'm going to put it a to do on my list because that we are not going to fix today. Okay. Fix project action. All right. Well, you know, I hope that would have worked. That would have been cool, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, these things are live, right? We do it live. Yep. So now we need to create some to dos for our project. It's not really much use without anything to do. All right. So let's I go ahead and do that. Create a new list. Yeah, let's create a list. So you gave me some really good feedback earlier on the UI here, and I, I can make some improvements to the add to do uh, button here because it's not immediately obvious that this is actually a button. Uh, so I need to fix that. This is a. Uh, it's also on my list of uh, my own to dos. Let's uh, go ahead and add and uh, click that add new to do. Real quick, we do have a question in the chat that's from uh, yeah. Ed MBN, which is, do we have the code available on GitHub? Not quite, because you're still doing some polishing, but when it is available, where would be the best place to find it? Yeah, so it'll be in the Remix repo. I I'm also going to have my own repo. Before we put it in the Remix repo, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and create my own just to get it up faster, because we're going to put it in the Remix examples directory eventually and then start building onto it. Uh, but I'll have that code ready for everyone this week, and I'll... Then I'll give it to you too, so we can share it to your your audience. Sounds good. But it will all be open, yeah, for sure. So yeah, uh, thank you for your your question. Unfortunately, um, the answer is just not quite yet. Um, but that's just because this repo needs to be even better uh, to 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 share it. It'll be ready this week. Promise. Awesome. Thank you. Promise. All right. Let's uh, create that list. Let's do it. Boom. So we got a to-do list. So we click on that and we can actually see some action items for our list. It tells us what project we're in and we've got a list of to-dos that we can click around on and, and check out. And once we've clicked on them, we can we could also delete them if we wanted to. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's that's our to-do list now. So let's, let's go and actually take a look at this to-do list. So if we go back to our code editor, well, first of all, before you do that, check, check out the URL. Uh, okay. We've got this URL slash dashboard slash to-do lists slash big old blob of text. What in the heck is that? Should probably make that a prettier URL, but it is what it is. That is our, our dynamic ID for this to-do list, right? Okay. This is the unique identifier that tells us which to-do list we're looking at. So let's go back and figure out how we get to that. All right. So in our routes directory, we've got the dashboard, right? We notice we have a nested URL. The URL structure being nested mirrors our routes directory, right? We've got these nested routes. So think of the routes directory hierarchy is uh, mapping to our URL structure. So dashboard slash to-do list slash dynamic ID slash nothing, right? That dynamic ID is denoted in a routes directory by this dollar sign. So we've okay. got this directory called list ID it starts with a dollar sign. That's now a dynamic route segment. So anything that we, if we have a dynamic route segment and we don't actually see a specific route that matches that segment, it's going to be assumed to be dynamic. So we, that's where we're getting that list ID, right? And that's available in our route as a route parameter. Plus, if we take a look at the index route inside of the list ID, the index route is the index for that, that specific route. So when we don't have an additional route segment after that, we're assumed to be on our index, right? You don't need an index in a directory, but if you have multiple nested routes inside of list ID like we do, we're going to have an index route. Does the route itself get the, uh, I, I saw it in the action. Um, mm -hmm. So action gets a params property and params As does our loader. Has list ID. Uh, does, no. the, does the route component itself get the list ID? It, it could, but we don't actually need it in the route component, okay. which is we don't see it. And uh, I'll show you because all we use that that segment for is to fetch the pro or fetch the to do list and the project. 
Gotcha. So if we remember when we go to our URL, we call our loader function. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at our loader function and see what's happening. Yeah. Get rid of a few of these distractions. There we go. Yep. So inside of our loader function, we're getting that list ID from the params that comes from our route params. Okay. And it's on the list ID key because that's what we've called it in our route with that dollar sign, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a PHP old school developer like myself, you recognize the dollar sign as a variable, right? So that we we call it a dollar sign in the route, and that becomes the key for our params. So we get that list ID. We require a user on this route. We want to authenticate, and if we're not authenticated, so this is how you would authenticate any route. You would call uh, a function that checks your, your user session on the server, and mm -hmm. if you're not uh, not authenticated, you would want to redirect them somewhere else. This is just a, a light abstraction over that, but we're requiring our user, um, and then we're going to start fetching our information about our list in our projects. And that's where this list ID comes in. So we call this, so we wait for all of these promises to resolve. This calls all of, uh, this makes all of these requests concurrently, which is really nice. This reduces our network waterfall that you're going to see in a lot of, a lot of websites where it sort of has, you have to call one function yeah. and then wait and then call another function and then wait and call another function. We can yeah. call all of our async functions concurrently with promise to all. And once all of those are resolved, we've got our data and we can move forward with our loader. Yeah, it's because like um, in in a lot of those applications where you've got that kind of waterfall, it would be something like, oh, uh, users trying to access this uh, to do list. Well, first we have to fetch the user so that we know like what projects they have access to. And okay, we need to now fetch their projects. And now that we've got their projects, we need to fetch the to do list. And you've already got this like chain because you can't just hop directly to the to do list. You have to make sure like every step along the way is working. That's right. And there's no magic involved in that because we're just using the platform. We're just using native fetch and we're using promises, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's no Remix magic here other than the fact that Remix completely relies on the platform. It gives us a lot of power, right? We're relying on, in this case, we've got a node server. Remix also supports non-node targets like Cloudflare workers, which is really cool. We're going to support Deno very soon. So it's not just node, uh, but we, we're going to support pretty much any platform that is going to support native uh, platform functionality like fetch. So um, pretty cool that I think that we, we get to do all this stuff basically for free because it's what the platform gives us. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So yeah, once we fetch our to-do list and our projects, we're going to make sure we actually got a to-do list back from our database request. Um, if we don't, we'll just redirect them. We could also handle an error there if we wanted to. This was just out of uh, convenience for me, but we're going to check to see if we have a project with uh, associated with our to-do list. If we don't have that project, again, we're just going to redirect them. Mm -hmm. We could handle that error differently if we wanted. Uh, but then once we have our, our the project associated with that to-do list as well as the list itself, we're going to return it as data that we can access in our component. Okay. And that's where we get all of the information that we're going to render. Makes so sense. if you go down to our opponent again, you're going to see everything <laughs> from that use loader data function, right? Got it. So I can start to uh, do stuff with to-do lists, like iterate yeah. over. Okay. So you also see this use fetchers hook. What what the heck is that? So let's talk about that. Okay. Use fetchers. Um, use fetchers is so we, we talked a little bit about the form component already, right? We, we remix exports a form component to allow you to uh, make a post request. Uh, just using plain old form with some progressive enhancement, right? Mm -hmm. What happens with a form? This is just how the HTML form works by default is it's going to post to a specific URL, right? Yeah. And what it's going to do when you get that data back is it's going to return that URL. You're going to go to that URL, right? So if you're posting to any other route other than the route that you're on, you're going to navigate to that route. You know, you can think of a, a link and an anchor tag is just a fancy form essentially, right? It's a form that posts to the route in your href. I mean, it's posting a get request. It's actually a get request, not a post request. Okay. Um, but it's really just a fancy form that's a little simpler to write. But um, but what use fetchers is is sometimes you want to sometimes you want to make a request to a to a different URL, but not actually navigate to that URL. You just want that data back. Yeah. And that's where use fetchers come or use fetcher comes in. And we've got the use fetcher and use fetchers. They're two separate hooks. We'll talk about those more specifically in a moment. But use fetchers. Um, is going to, you can have multiple fetcher forms or multiple fetchers in the same route, and they might all be in flight. They may all be fetching some data at the same time. And you might want to handle independent fetchers 
and you might want to handle them in a specific order. You might want to deal with race conditions. You might want to you might want to do a number of things with your various in-flight requests, right? Yeah. Before they actually get back, you might want to show some ending UI. You might there's a bunch of stuff you might want to do. Again, what would we normally do to deal with data loading? We'd use state. We'd use an effect, right? Yeah. We don't have any state in this app, right? Even though we are doing stuff that technically feels stateful, all of that state is still coming from the server. Okay. So that fetcher is going to have some data attached to it. It's going to tell you what type, what's the type of that fetcher, right? The fetcher that we're dealing with in this particular moment, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll show where that actually, that magic actually happens in a minute. But the fetcher that we're dealing with now is dealing with a form submission that is going to update our to-dos, right? And we actually, because we have multiple fetchers, we could be dealing with different types of fetchers. We could be dealing with submissions that are submitting to our edit endpoint, which is going to update the details on a to-do. We could have submissions uh, posting to our new endpoint, which is going to create a new to-do list or a new to-do item, right? Okay. Uh, we could have we could be posting to our delete endpoint. So we we can tell exactly which fetcher we're dealing with based on the based on the um, the action that we posted to, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So we look at all of the fetchers that we've got in flight and we can manipulate data based only on those fetchers. And what we can do is we can essentially derive state in our component from data from the server. So we don't actually need to set any state. We just create some objects that are, that are created on render and they render whatever data comes from our server. Where, where are we doing that? it can that? happen synchronously. So what we're doing here in this in this loop is we're at, we're effectively getting all of our to-dos that we want to render. And the reason we're doing this, instead of just getting project dot or to-do list dot to-dos and rendering whatever came from the server, mm -hmm. the reason we're doing it this way is we actually want to optimistically update this UI so that the, the interactions feel instantaneous. So we're not actually going to get that data back. As, as soon as you click that button. If we're hitting a real server, right now it's all local, so it's going to be pretty fast anyway. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with a real server, it might come back slow. You might have a slow connection and somebody might be waiting a few seconds before they get any data back, right? But yeah. you want your app to feel really nice and snappy, right? So we we call this optimistic. We don't call it optimistic UI. Everybody calls it. This is just what it's called, right? Like we didn't invent that term. Um, but this is how you would deal with optimistic UI in Remix. You would derive the state from the data that you get based on the transition from okay. that fetcher. So what state is that fetcher in right now? If the state is is submitting, if, if we're busy in that to-do loop or in that uh, for loop, you can see that we're checking to see what state our fetcher is in. And if we're in a certain state, then we know we're busy. We can go ahead and update the UI before that data ever comes back. And if the data doesn't come back or we get an error from the data, if there's a problem, we, we can handle that in our cache boundary. We can render a cache boundary, uh, boundary here and handle that in the UI directly. I'm trying to so figure out where that actually happens, though. So I see, like, like where, yeah, where, where are we displaying yeah, the, the so, like, yeah. So scroll back up for a moment. Um, let's, yeah. let's take, we'll just walk through the loop real quick, because the loop's actually doing a, a bunch of things. Because okay. we're looking at all of our fetchers. But we've got this, so the one that I'm, I'm talking about primarily right now is this all to-dos array. Okay. So right before the loop starts, we're, we're creating an array of to-do to, to -do items. And this is initially just whatever we have from the server, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever we have from the server right now is our, okay. our to-dos. And if our, so scroll back down. So the, the second if statement is actually the one that I want to talk about. Um, the new. So if... If we have a submission, so if fetcher.submission, so first of all, if there is a submission at all, if okay. there's not a submission currently happening, there would be no fetcher submission. So this only happens if there's a submission. So if there's if there's a submission currently in flight and the action is posting to a new, to create a new to-do, right? This mm -hmm. new action is is intended to create new to-dos. Mm -hmm. We're going to optimistically update, update our to-dos with this temporary derived state, right? Okay. This is just like in memory state, right? This is only happening as we render the component. But once we get that data back, we're going to call render again on the whole route component. And that time and it's going to get the list of all the ones from the server and whatever's on our brand server. new yep. to do that's been finalized in the database. Okay. Exactly. Got and it. if our Got it. if our server throws an error, we can deal with that error in the catch boundary. Got but it. right now we are 
we're optimistically updating our UI before we actually get any data back from the server. And uh, we don't have to have any state for that. And so we here we're using in all to do's, which is our uh, to do's we got from the server plus the to do's that are currently in flight on their way to the server. Got it. That's exactly right. And and this all, I know that's what's really weird, right? We're all like, what are we creating this like mutable array for? And like, this is not the React that I know. This is not the immutable React that I know and love, right? Mm -hmm. it, it takes a little bit of a paradigm shift, but the, the point is, is that we can update the UI and create an app that feels really, really snappy. And mm -hmm. another really cool thing about the Fetchers API is that all of the race conditions that you might imagine happening as you're clicking to do is really, really fast and you've got a server responding slowly, Remix handles all that for you. So you don't have to worry about the user clicking so fast that your server can't handle the, we've got like a jillion tests to deal with all kinds of weird race conditions. So um, it's it's actually really cool. I'm, I, we don't have time to get into the nuts and bolts of all that stuff, but it's pretty cool how that stuff works under the hood. So, and it's all open source. So if you are really fascinated by that kind of thing, you know, go jump in, take a look. Pretty right. deep. Um, but yeah, we've got multiple fetchers because we are dealing with uh, posts to our edit eight, our edit endpoint to update it to do our uh, our new endpoint and our delete endpoint. Um, we're not going to go through every single one of those, but that's that's what's happening in that loop. We're looking at all of our fetchers and and deciding what to to do based on what that action or what to render based on what that action currently in flight is uh, is giving us. Okay. Got it. Very cool. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. yeah, like there's a lot going on, but it's very cool to see uh, how this stuff all fits together. Um, yeah, so I guess my grand summary of what I've learned so far, um, loaders, that's us getting data from the, the server. Actions yes. are us mutating the data that the server has access, uh, has access to. So um, I would almost think of that as like in GraphQL land, that's uh, what mutation yep. covers, right? Um, yep, exactly. Fetchers are for the stuff that's currently in flight um, that like hasn't quite been persisted in the database yet, but we want to update the UI to make it look like it totally has. So everything uh, uh, everything seems a lot faster regardless of network connection speeds. Okay. Yeah. Caveat. Uh, only, the only caveat on the fetcher thing is that they're uh, think of fetchers if you're making a request to a different URL that you don't want to ultimately navigate to. Oh, okay. If you do. Got it. If you do want to navigate to that URL, you can use our, our plain old uh, our form component. Uh, you can also create a plain HTML form, and uh, we we also expose a hook called use submit. And those APIs are actually quite a bit sim uh, quite a bit simpler than the okay. Fetcher API. But the Fetcher API is really handy if you want to post uh, to a uh, to an endpoint that you don't want to navigate to, and you just want to handle that data right there in the same route. And okay. if you have multiple things going on at once, again, you can use all of those Fetchers to get all of that data. Mm -hmm. all of the data associated with that that request so um that's that's the one caveat because i would generally recommend if you're just you know posting to a different url and you plan to navigate to that url later like we did with our sign in form mm -hmm. i would use the form api okay. um, but all of that yeah i would take a look at the remix docs for both the form api uh, the use submit api and the use fetcher api and, and read through the nuances in those okay Whew. Lots of stuff to yeah. get, to uh, get this get this up and running. But um, are there more things you wanted to show or things you wanted to add to this? Yeah, I think I think we can move on from this because I actually want to get to what our project is say, right? <laughs> like we we we've talked a lot, right? Oh, yeah. We've been on this thing for an hour now. We've we've done a lot of talking. Tried to explain everything as best I can in in a one hour situation, but you want to build some stuff too. Yes. So one thing that I really want to do is I want to, so when, if you hit the back button real quick, oh, the sure. browser, let's yeah, go back Chrome, to, uh, Chrome's doing this thing where it like hops uh, down. It's, it's okay. weird. Okay. So I hit back. No worries. So what I really want to do is instead of when I click the, the to-do list, instead of navigating to a separate page, I would love it if that to-do list just appeared on the right hand side of the same page. Right. Okay. Um, I don't actually want to change my view here. I want to use the same layout for uh, for this just to see my to-do list, but I want to see it right there on my, my project dashboard. So what I'm going to do here is instead of uh, navigating to this to-do route, I'm going to create or I'm going to have you create a new route. Okay. So let's go over to our code and pop open your app directory and pop open its routes directory. 
And inside there, you're going to go in your projects, uh, your projects directory. And inside there, you're going to open up the project ID. So what I want here is I want to, I want my URL to be dashboard slash projects ID, uh, or project slash project, or sorry, projects slash project ID slash lists. So create, um, let me see here. What, what did I ultimately do here? I think I created a list, a list, just create a directory inside of the project ID directory and just call it list. It's plain old L I S T. And inside there, create a new file and call it dollar sign list ID use camel case and dot TSX or JSX doesn't matter. We'll, we'll keep a TypeScript and we'll, we'll do work with some TypeScript. So um, now what I want you to do is I want you to go into the back up a bit and go into your to-do lists, list ID folder there. And I want you to open up that index file. Okay. Now I want you to uh, just go ahead and copy all that code. Got it. Okay. Copy the whole route and then paste it into that new, uh, new file you just created. And go ahead and press save. Let's, uh, let's just start here. Okay. Let's go into, so now let's go into our, back into our project ID file, that dynamic project ID route. This one right here? Uh, that's the one, yeah. Okay. And so what I want to do here is I want to, um, I want to do, so what we have essentially done just now is we've created a nested route, right? Um, and we talked earlier about our, you know, when we looked at our root file, right? We, we had this root file that rendered that outlet. Remember outlet? Yeah. Let me, let me so, pop that back open and you go ahead. Yeah. So outlet, you can have more than one outlet in your route hierarchy. And the way the outlet is going to work, if you've got a second outlet nested inside, is it's going to handle all of your routes that are nested inside of your current route. So we can create a nested route UI based on the routing structure, and we can render whatever is nested inside of our project ID through another outlet. Okay. And so that's exactly what we want to do. If we go ahead and take a look, if, if you just jump back to the browser real quick, we We've got this space where we don't have a space yet, but we want to create a space right next to our to-do list where we render our actual to-do list. And that's going to be our new route. Okay. And it's just going to stay right there in the same UI. It's just, we're just going to pop it in a, in a separate div essentially. Makes sense. Um, so in our project ID, I'm looking for, um, what I, what I want you to look for is we've got this layout component, um, it's got this main prop that actually handles our, uh, that's where all of the to-do lists are rendered. This is kind of a big mm. chunky component, but we can, you can collapse all that stuff is what I actually want to do, um, collapse the, the div right underneath flexor. Right underneath. Okay. Yeah. That guy. So right after that, I want you to just render an outlet component. Yeah. That's just been pulled in already. Nope, we're going to need to import that. So add that import from Remix to the top of your file. Someone says that you work at Microsoft, so you're contractually obligated to use TypeScript. You know, there's some truth to that. Uh, um, okay, cool. So we've so got that this, now. Yeah, so this is going to render our, out, our, our, our outlet responsible for handling all of our nested routes. Um, so the next thing I want you to do is there is a link that is linking to our to-do list. Um, I, I think it's on line 243. Which of course you, you didn't have to look up, you just kind of knew. Yeah, I, I know all of the code that is yeah. on every single line and every project that I work on. It is it's one of my unknown blast. skills. Sorry, so what am I looking for? So right, uh, right up there too. So it's actually 237 in yours. We've got some, okay. uh, 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 I must've changed the code, but yeah. So, so this link right now, what, so the link that we, this link component that we use also comes from Remix and the way that link is going to work again, it mirrors react router because we're really powering all of our routing with react router six, mm -hmm. um, this dot dot slash convention, um, uh, react router uses nested routing. And we're also able to link relative to our current route. 
So these relative links, you can ring, well, link relative to your current route just the same way you would imagine uh, CDing into a different directory. The, mm -hmm. the dot dot syntax is just going to back you up to the next route level up. And so we're currently rank, uh, linking to to do list slash list ID. We actually want to link to list without the dots at all and without without the initial slash. So go ahead and remove the dot and the initial slash and just say list slash. Oh, yeah, okay, list slash, okay. Yeah, so now, where's this going to link? It's going to link relative to your current route, which is your project ID. Okay. So dashboard slash project slash project ID slash list slash list ID. Putting that to the test now. Yeah. We'll see We'll see what changes, if anything. Um. Oh, oh, okay. Well, why did it show up there? Because that's where our outlet is. Okay, and I'm looking at the... Uh... URL there and yeah okay so yeah, it just works pretty cool, that's awesome that's all, all all there is to it right uh, now you can style that and do whatever you need to do to to make it look pretty um, sure. which I would probably recommend because right now it's a little little cluttered but uh, we could clean that up a little bit um, yeah so now we've got a nested route and go ahead and create some more to do lists and flip around and see them change and they're only going to change in that uh, that part of the page. Okay. So, all right. I open up action items and it pops up over there. Very cool. And then mm -hmm. I open up list two and it pops up over there. Yeah. We've also, because of our scroll restoration, um, because of our scrolling, we, we would probably want to make some changes to the scroll behavior in, in a nested route situation like this, just for a little bit better user experience here. But we don't really have time to deal with scroll stuff today. Sure. So. We can we can revisit that in a future episode perhaps, but uh, but yeah we've got uh, yeah we've got pretty good nested UI here though pretty all right pretty happy with it. So uh, one one more thing I'd like to do is we've got we've got this list over here on the right. We can check to dos either completed or we can delete them. But I do notice that we can't actually create new to dos on our list, which is not really useful. So okay. let's do that next. Let's go into your the new component that you created, the new route component inside of to do or project slash project ID slash list. Probably don't want that nested of a URL, but yeah. So what we what we want to do here is we want to create a UI for for creating a new to do. Okay. So um Below your route component, really anywhere, it doesn't really matter, but somewhere uh, in the root of the file, we want to create a new component. Okay. And I want to call it just create a function. That, yeah, totally fine. Call it uh, to do or new to do form. Okay. And it's going to take some props. So let's go ahead and give it some props. You can be structured and not completely up to you. Um, and let's give it a list ID prop. Um, since we're using TypeScript, it's going to yell at us for not typing this prop. So, uh, no, actually, so your your syntax is a little off here. Let's go. Sure. Um, so, since you're destructuring the object, you're actually going to put the type definition uh, after the closing bracket. And this is going to be, so create a new object. There you go. Now say list ID, colon, string, but lowercase. Uh, lowercase. Lower S. Yeah. Because string capital is the, uh, so a capital uh, uppercase C is going to be the constructor for a string object, which you don't want. Um, so yeah, so this is our new to do form and we are going, so go ahead and, um, before we return, so what we're going to return here is we're going to return a form in, uh, that we get from a fetcher. So this is, we're going to explore how the fetcher, uh, we, we never actually got to where the fetcher, what the fetcher was actually submitting. So we're going to do that now. Let's go ahead and get a fetcher by calling, uh, we'll say a new variable called to do fetcher. And we will call use fetcher, which we're going to import from uh, Remix, which I think is already imported in this component. Looks like it. And we're also we are going to create some state here. And the reason I want to create some state is because we've got a form field that um, we want to clear after we insert put some data in that. And we do want to hold that in state because it's just easier to, to clear that form field in state. You could clear it by uh, updating your key after submission, but that also clears focus, and we don't want to do that. So I'm just going to use state. Okay. We do need state sometimes. So call this value and set value and initialize with an empty string. 
You got it. Oh, I guess. Uh, no, no yeah, yeah, yeah. Initial state. There you go. Look at me, promising, promising I know React. That's okay. We'll, we'll get there. Um, and let's go ahead. Let's create a new variable. Call it submission action. And get it from, you know, it's, this is going to come from your to-do fetcher dot submission. And if you have, remember I said earlier, if you have a submission at all, it's, so submission is an object. If you have one, it means you're in flight. This fetcher, th there's some fetcher in flight, right? Or this fetcher is in flight. So mm -hmm. if this submission is defined, it'll be in flight. But we, we actually want to get one more property on it. So you can use optional chaining syntax if you want um, and call dot action. Because we really only care about the action itself. Okay. Um, so now let's create a, uh, let, let's leave this, let's come back to this actually. Uh, so go ahead and return what we're going to render. And we're going to render, so uh, open a new JSX tag and call it the do fetcher. Um, there's actually an item, no, no, sorry, there's a, there's a component attached to do fetcher called form. And that's what we're going to okay. render. Interesting. Um, and again, this is just like an HTML form, except the only difference is we're not going to navigate to this route after we submit the form. Okay. One thing that you could do if you wanted to is in that in, in the endpoint that we're going to post to, we could actually render a UI there and create some more progressive enhancement for our users because if they don't have if if JavaScript isn't enabled or if they again have a slow connection then they would just render a plain form and they would navigate to that URL. So mm -hmm. we don't want them to necessarily, but we could have a fallback in that case by just rendering a component at that URL, right? Okay. Because then it would just be a plain old HTML form. But in our case, we don't want, to, want them to navigate. So we're going to add a progressively enhanced feature via the fetcher to handle that for them. So inside of, so our, we're going to have some props in the form too. So the let's props, define okay. some props. Yeah. Cool. And so our props for our form, we're going to have an action because we're posting to a different URL. Um, that action is going to, it's actually going to be a string and it's going to be start with dashboard, um, slash dashboard. You actually have to have the root slash here because we don't, I don't want to do relative URLs. We're in okay. a nested structure here. So we're just going to do an absolute. So dashboard slash to do's slash new. Why don't you open up that route file real quick so we can see what that's actually going to do. Yeah. Because so this request is going to go directly to that route. Dashboard. Okay. Slash uh, to do's slash new. new. Okay. Pop that. So it's really easy to know exactly what we're posting to. Yeah. So when, um, what we're posting to is going to call our action. So we're interested in the action this route exports. So again, this is a lot like our, a lot like our sign in form. Okay. Where we get the data from the form. We handle it in the action. We validate it, make sure it's all good data. And then if we ensure that we have good data, we respond with the actual to-do itself. If we don't have good data, we respond with whatever error we want to allow the route to, to handle. So you can think of this as like an API route. We call them resource routes in Remix. Um, this route is only responsible for giving us a resource. We post to it. It gives us a resource. There's no UI associated with it. Oh. There's no component. Um, it's only handling requests. So this is an API route, and you can return any data you want from an API route or resource route. Um, you, you can literally, as long as it's serializable and you can send it across the wire, you can return it. So okay. you could return static CSS this way. You could return files this way. Um, there's all kinds of things you can use resource, uh, resource routes for. In this case, we're using it to post to our server to create a new to-do. So we can go back to our list ID component and finish wiring that up. We want to um, go ahead and give it a class name. I've got some, just got some basic styles I want to add here. Sure. Um, we just got some utilities. Uh, call, go say flex. And then uh, another one for flex, col, flex call. I stole these from um, Tailwind. But, um, and then another one that says gap dash four. We're just okay. going to put some things in here at a little flex column stack Make them um, and then we want to say method post because we don't the default method is a get we, we're not handling get requests we're handling post requests so there you go uh, i think it's only lowercase actually like in this it. case yeah okay um and that's just a, for easier to be consistent when we're sure. dealing with them in the actions but 
Uh, we also, so inside of our form, let's go ahead and render a hidden input. So input type hidden. Um, this is just going to hold our list ID. So go ahead and say name is equal to list ID, camel case. And then the value is going to be our list ID that we pass via props. Okay. And then we're going to, uh, I've got some abstractions that I'm going to, uh, some minor abstractions that I'm going to use. Um, go ahead and render below this. I'm going to call it field provider. And you're going to import this from our UI directory. This is just a, uh, Look at that. TypeScript knows what to import. Yep. Um, I think it's VS Code doing that magic. But anyway, in our field provider, give it a name, and it's just going to be the string name. This is going to be the name of our to-do. Okay. Uh, give it an ID. Call it new to-do. This is just so that um, the label knows what it's associated with for accessibility. Um, we're going to have. A, we're going to make this a required field. So let's say required. And then also, we're going to disable this field while our um, fetcher is in flight. So go ahead and say disabled is equal to, and say to do fetcher dot state is not equal to idle. So we're going to just disable this field if for whatever reason uh, our state is anything but idle. Um, so the way that the fetchers, the fetchers all have their own state. Again, we get all that from the server. Um, it starts idle, then it is then you're going to go into a different state as the request is happening, but then once it's returned, it's going to be idle again. So if okay. it's idle, we can edit the field. Uh, we cannot, we can edit, we can only edit the field if it's idle. And then inside of this, we're going to render a label, but call it uppercase label, okay. uh, which we'll also import from our UI directory. Um, and this is just going to associate the label with our field and call it new to do. Like, oh, just in here. Yeah, it's just a. Yeah, or no, I'm sorry, just this string that says this is just a static oh, label for our field. Uh, yeah. See. And then below that, we can render a um, a field component. It's just called field. And also, we're going to import that from UI as well. And this is going to have a value prop. And this is going to hold our value state. And value, yep, that's our, our mm -hmm. state up here. Okay. okay. Yep. Um, and then I think you accidentally imported value from somewhere. And this VS Code does this to me all the time, but I'm, I'm not sure. But, Just did um, a few commands yeah. there, so hopefully, hopefully it's undone now. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, give it an on change prop too, so we can set the value. And this this part's not explicitly necessary, but we, like I said, I want to um, I want to clear the field after we okay. after we uh, deal with the data. So the on change prop is going to have an event parameter. Oh. Okay. And then we're going to set the value to event dot target dot value. Oh yeah, okay, got it. Chat's getting quiet. Either everybody's completely lost, or I'm boring the absolute crap out of everybody. I hope it's not that one. Let me let me liven things up. Hey, a chat, y'all live? Come on, chat. All good. All good. Zoned in. Oh, okay. Zoned in. Zoned in. That's a I forgot option three is just completely zoned in and like mind blown. So all right, um, there we go. Just making sure we got some life out there. Thanks. We got some uh, um, light hypnosis going on. Um, I'm very okay. self conscious. I need validation. Well, I'm like a, there's I'm like a there's Mormon, some but... of that. Yeah, uh, it's somewhere in here. It's like in your utils validation. Right <laughs> That's there. right. Um, yeah, cool. So we got our on. I think we're good on the field. Um, okay. So right below the field provider. Oh. Um, after the field provider. Sorry. Got it. Is this can field be self-closing? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Cool. There's there's no children. It's just an input. Um, you got this it. is just a fancy UI wrapper that uh, also provides all of the field data to both the field and the label. It's just easier, I think, than matching up IDs and all that stuff. And it's Makes for sense. ARIA purposes. So, okay. um, so yeah, right below field provider, go ahead and render a div. And inside the div, we're just going to render an uppercase button. This is a custom button component that we're also going to render from or get from our UI. Yep, there you go. That's the one. Um, go ahead and give it a don't worry about the class name. Um, just say create to do. Real quick, button has a type attribute, right? Yeah. HTML button has a type attribute. What's its default value? Without uh, the default is just 
button, but then no, no, no. Is it? Every, is it I, I thought that too. Is I it, thought that too. Is it submit? Yes, it's submit. Really? I thought that too. Remember when I say Remix has to te reteach you HTML? I completely forgot that. Huh. Uh, I knew it at one point, forgot it. Um, but yeah, I, I, so the default type of a button is is actually submit. So we don't actually have to say this is a submit button, but we want it to be a submit button. Interesting. So you can, yeah, so you can say, uh, why is it? Oh, it's just slow to catch up. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, so this will totally goof you up. Um, in re well, it, it'll goof you up in HTML period, but like, um, especially like in React, you know, how do we normally submit a form if we're writing client side React code? We always prevent default behavior anyway and do our own client side submission logic, right? Gotcha. Um, so we don't we don't have to worry about silly things like this. We just say on click, body yada yada yada, whatever. Okay. But but when we're dealing with plain old HTML forms, we have to remember these types of things. So um, if you have more than one button anywhere inside of a form, make sure you say type button because its default value is submit. So, so if it's doing anything other than submitting or resetting the form, it means you need to have a type attribute. And here we are looking to submit. Like that's what we want. That's right. I just wanted to call that out because, I, like I said, yeah. I totally forgot this at one point and had to relearn it. And I say I think so many people for either forget or or just think that the type, the default type, is button. Yeah, interesting. Um, and we've got Michael Chan in the chat who says that's why you have to add the attribute because it can accidentally submit forms in older browsers. Wild. Today I learned. Yep, yep. There you go. So um, I think we're good here. So let's go now that we have. So this is our component. Like we've written this new to do form component. Let's go ahead and render it in a couple of places. Okay. Um, go yeah. up to line, I think I want to say it's going to be like 223 or something. There you go. So right after that separator, that HR. Uh, okay, right here. So right after here. that, go ahead and render our uh, new to-do form. This needs the list ID. Yeah, and it's going to just be, you're going to get that from your to-do list object. So to-do list.id. To-do list.id, okay. And just go ahead and copy that guy, the whole the component you just rendered. And we're going to render it in that uh, that fallback clause if we don't have any to-dos as well. So right under where it says no to-dos for this list yet. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, now let's save that guy and right. go check out our UI. And it's already there. Um, Marco says, that's why every button abstraction I built used to have type equals button as a default. Now with Remix, I think it kind of doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, yeah, it is... I don't know. It, it, it's weird because, Marco, like you are overriding browser defaults there, but also you're overriding them to a new default that I think is what most people expect. Eh, still trying to figure out how I used to do the that. same thing. Yeah I, yeah, I used to do the same thing. Um, I don't need more mostly just because I'm just so used to it being the default that I, I want I think it's more for like my own memory. Like I just, mm -hmm. it helps me remember that that's the default because yeah. if you goof it up, you, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's wrong. So, um, there's also the type reset too, which is using yeah. forms to clear all the data. So, um, but let's go ahead and, and create a new to do and test this guy out. See, make, make something else to do. Ooh. Boom. There it goes. Pops right up on our incomplete to do. How did that work? Hang on. Let's add a little bit more functionality. Let's go back to our new to do form component. Because okay. um, I mentioned clearing the field value after we submit. Yeah. Um, so create right under your uh, submission action uh, variable that we didn't end up using. Let's go ahead and write a use effect. A React use effect. Help if I could spell React correctly. Turns out. I don't spell anything right. I just rely on TypeScript to fix it for me. Usually, nine out of ten times it uh, it does. So. <laughs> Um, so inside of our effect, we're going to call a function, or this is a function, obviously. So um, we're going to check if our submission action, so check if submission action dot, um, so submission action is going to be a string if it exists, so uh, dot starts with. We're going to check okay. that it starts with a certain substring. Um, and since TypeScript is very smart, it knows that this might be undefined, so it does the, the chaining for us, which is very, nice. very nice. Uh, so open and I'm going to convince you to switch to TypeScript on this on either either today or later. I am sold on the value proposition of TypeScript. I just have not been like I have I've not like played with it enough. I haven't actually really started doing it. My my new role though, it's funny like folks mentioned like oh I'm contractually obligated to use TypeScript now. <laughs> yeah. Like of course we use TypeScript at Microsoft, but um, like I'm I'm sold on the value proposition. Just 
haven't actually really gotten to using it day in day out. Uh, cool. So well, Martin's, now, now we've... Martin's calling out that to do app is starting to look like Basecamp. Shh. We don't we don't say these things out loud. You don't say these things out loud. I'm just kidding. Total coincidence. That absolutely complete coincidence that we called it PM Camp. Um, of course. Yeah. So uh, I never said I was that creative. Okay. Let's uh, let's get that out of the way right now. So uh, yeah, we've got our we've got our stuff. Oh yeah. So what are we doing? We're, we're we want to clear this field. So check that our action starts with because we. Remember, we might have, um, yeah, actually, let's just go ahead and check this. We, we probably don't even actually need to check this, but I'm going to check it anyway, because I might want to create another action sure. later. Um, so check that it starts with um, dash to do, or sorry, dash dashboards, the same action that we used in our form. We can even say equal to um, if we wanted to. Yeah, in, in our form, so. I usually say starts with just because sometimes we'll have params at the end or something. Oh, okay. um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll just copy that action and, and pop I, that in there. I know we've got a few people um, in the chat who are like regularly using Remix. I would be incredibly curious like how y'all are going about this because it also feels like you could use like a regex match and stuff like that. Be curious to yes. know what y'all's preferences are here and if the Remix community has landed on conventions here. Not really. This is um, this is how I write it. Okay. Uh, this is mostly just JavaScript. Like Remix yeah. isn't really forcing your hand on most of this stuff. So um, you know, we might provide higher level APIs for some mm -hmm. of these in the future. Um, I think the goal for this first version was to get as close to all the platform as you yeah. need. Like we didn't want to abstract things too early. We didn't want to um, give you tools that you couldn't actually dig into and use for whatever UI you wanted to render. So we may explore higher level abstractions than mm -hmm. what we have today. In fact, I would bet money on it. Like, I, I think by V2, V3, you're going to start seeing some some more conventions pop okay. up to handle some of these things with a little less typing. But for now, um, they're pretty low level, and that's by design. So, um, and and someone also said this too. Um, I thought the goal of Remix was not to use effect and use state. Um, that is not necessarily the goal of Remix. The goal of Remix is not to get rid of React. We love React, right? Like these are these hooks are core fundamental pieces of React. Um, I think of use state and use effect in a remix app as tools to provide pro uh, progressive enhancement, which mm -hmm. is exactly what we're doing now, right? We are, we're right now all we're using this effect for. So we're going to check to make sure if we're if we're currently submitting, we want to clear the value in that form field because if it's submitting, we're optimistically updating the UI while it submits. So let's go ahead and clear the value because if we clear the value, it's as if we've mm -hmm. already created this do that to do is already in flight and it's handled up above in our other component in that use fetchers hook, right? Because yeah. it's going to be one of those um, one of those fetchers that this thing catches. So it's going to pop up there immediately. It's going to clear the field immediately and it's going to look like it just happens, right? Yeah. So this is a progressive enhancement right here. It is um, not but we want it is not required like for a usable experience, it's not required to clear this out. However, it is a nice to have, right? So if the JavaScript hasn't loaded yet, you know, um, or if, you know, some network hiccup comes up and the JavaScript doesn't load, right? You still have a functional minimum viable experience, but, you know, if it does load, it's nice to do a few things like this uh, for user experience purposes. And, and totally. that's kind of the totally. goal of progressive enhancement here. Yeah, we're not out to get rid of state or use state or use effect or any of the built-in hooks. We're out there. We, we can help you get rid of a lot of them because a lot of the things that you used to need state for and used to use effects for, you don't need to anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's not our goal. And we, you know, we we really love React and we love its core APIs and we, we want to use them to create great experiences. So, um, so we also want a dependency in this dependency array too. Uh, go ahead and pop submission action in there too. So, um, anytime our submission action changes, we recheck and see if it's in flight. If it is, clear that value. Okay. And I think you can give it a save. Let's try it out. Okay. And if you fill out the, if you just add and press enter, now, okay. guess what? You can just keep, you should be, should be able to keep on typing. Nice. It is, yeah, it's it does losing, focus, doesn't it? Yeah, we'll it's losing focus, that. but. Yeah, we'll fix that. I'll, uh, I'm going to make my own to-do in PM camp to fix focus management on this page. All right. Uh, else page. I think we have a default focus manager higher up in the tree that moves focus for to um, to the top. Okay. 
to, to one of the other elements to um, just for uh, usually when you route change in a in a in a client navigated app like this, you want to move focus to somewhere higher in the tree to yeah. something interactive at the top of the tree, right? In this case, we don't want to do that, so uh, I'm going to. Uh, yes, management. Yeah, I so um, this technique actually came from Marcy Set. I'm glad you're focusing, uh, you're searching for this because we don't build this in to Remix like Gatsby does. And, and the reason for that is there are certain cases like this one that we're seeing now where we need to override this behavior and yeah. we don't have good APIs for that just yet. So we're working on APIs to some, some extractions internally to improve this experience as best we can. Mm -hmm. For now, we sort of leave it up to the developer to make these decisions. So we don't want to abstract things that are really hard to get out of. Yeah. And that's the, the the ultimate goal. But we do want to provide easier APIs for focus management overall. But there are certain cases where you really do need to take more granular control of this experience. And this is this is definitely one of those. I so definitely um, had experiences with messy focus management and React applications. And it's one of those things of like uh, it's, so, hard. it's so hard to come up with the right abstraction for it because you could have a best practice, but the best practice is gonna work eight times out of ten right not even nine totally. times out of ten right and you need yeah, the, it, the escape hatch and the escape hatch has to be just as intuitive because otherwise like you're just going to lead to a bad keyboard experience if your focus management starts fighting with itself um exactly yeah for for sure and that article by uh marcy is great and they that team did a lot of really great research um because we really hadn't explored the, mm -hmm. the multiple like the client side routing community like there we had reach router which is something that um, one of my bosses ryan helped build right mm -hmm. and but reach router was really sort of an experiment um because we didn't really have best practices for routing and and react and focus and, and focus management like we were figuring that out as well mm -hmm. um and this the experiences that work really great for server rendered or server routed applications are not always the same for client routing applications yeah. so um, there's still a lot to be explored in this area. The uh, the core web platform, like the Chrome team, I know is working on the app history API, and they're, they're working on other APIs that might make this even easier in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of work done here, but there's still more to be done. There's still more exploration, and it's still sort of up to the developer at the end of the day to to know how to handle those route changes and how to move focus once the routes change. Um, and sometimes it you might not want to do anything when the route changes. Um, so yeah. You, it, at the end of the day, test your application screen readers and make sure it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think we're good. Like I, I feel pretty good about this. Aside from the sort of clunky CSS, we could we could make it prettier, but we can do that another time. I, sure. I feel good about what we built today. Absolutely. So I think this is a great time to open the floor for questions from the chat. If there's anything you wanted to see more of or anything that you're not quite clear on, um, please uh, uh, feel feel free to drop your questions in the chat, um, but we'll be, I think, wrapping up fairly soon. So if you've got questions, uh, get them in now. Um, and yeah. Uh, ben, did you have any questions for me? I don't think so at the moment. Like, I, I feel like I would want to, oh, actually, so, you know, at some point I would probably want to start like a remix project from the ground up, right? Like there was a lot here that was already built out, a lot of abstractions that were already provided things that we didn't look into today. Um, like we've seen a lot of the core concepts of Remix, but this wouldn't necessarily be a great like starting point for someone who's like not really seen Remix before, right? Like the, uh, they're, so for someone who might be looking to just fire up a new Remix project and kind of get started like from the ground up, like what are some resources we've got on that front? Yeah, so all that information is in our docs, but I'll tell you right now, if you pop open your terminal, we can start one up in about 30 seconds. Okay, let's try it. Uh, Back out into your uh, parent directory here somewhere, and then uh, run npx create-remix at latest, uh, okay. at symbol latest. Yeah, there you go. And then will, run this this guy. Me, will this ask me for a name of a directory? Or... It's going to ask you some questions, yeah. So go ahead okay. and run that guy. It's going to ask you... Um, first, you need to install the package, obviously. I said 30 seconds. That didn't account for the fact that you need to install it first. And you do. All so right. now it's going to ask you where do you want to create your app. And it's going to default to my Remix app, but you can call it whatever you want. 
right. and, you, and the next question is going to ask, uh, what do you, where do you want to deploy this thing? Um, this is a question that I think will trip some folks up early on because they're not, maybe you want to create an app and you're not entirely sure. Um, you can just use our Remix app server if you're not sure, and it creates a, a plain old express server for you in your directory. And then it's going to ask if you want to work with TypeScript or JavaScript, and you want to run install on all your dependencies. Okay. And so once this is done installing, you'll just CD into your Remix app, run npm run dev, and you're ready to go. Cool. Um, and I probably should not have actually told it to run npm install because I'm <laughs> yeah. not really going to look at that. Uh, can we quickly, real like real quickly, dive into maybe deployment? Uh, sure. So we we're not we don't have our own hosting platform just yet. So deploying, and, and I say just yet, we may never have. One. We're not a hosting company. So um, we. Remix's goal is to allow you to deploy pretty much anywhere. Um, and we're going to have, as you saw in that, um, those initial questions, we're going to have multiple deployment targets. Okay. So where you actually deploy is totally dependent on your, your deployment target. So it's actually, I think it's a good idea to sort of think about where you want to deploy and what that deployment looks like before you create a new app. If you're just playing around with it and you want to explore, totally start with the Remix app server and you can lock, you can deploy that to any node server you want. But um, we're not going to, so we've got a readme file in the root of this new directory that you just created, it's going to walk through both the development and the deployment through this application. Okay. Um, um, for for the plain Remix server, um, it's just a node server. So uh, if you wanted mm. to, you, you'd have to write your own script if you wanted some um, de deploy from GitHub situation. But we also deployed it for cell. We have an adapter to deploy to for cell. We have an adapter to deploy to Netlify. So if you're familiar and comfortable with those platforms, you can deploy there and. The, the readme file will walk you through uh, your GitHub synchronization and deployment techniques for those those targets. Okay. So, uh, but we, it, it is going to look a little different depending on where you deploy. Do we did we go with a uh, Remix app server for PM Camp? Or um, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Okay. Cool. So we we probably because I'm ultimately just running a local server. Got it. Okay. Cool. Um, I think doesn't seem like there's been any questions from the chat. So uh, I think let's go ahead and start wrapping this up. What do you think, Chance? I feel good. Um, yeah, like I said, this code is going to be up here pretty soon, and I'm going to share the link so everyone who watched will have access to dig in mm -hmm. even further. But in the meantime, check out my Twitter. Check out – oh, can we plug my course? Because I just released a course. Yeah. If you are watching this video and you're like, what the heck is this TypeScript thing? Um, first of all, TypeScript's awesome, in my humble opinion, but it's also kind of confusing, and it can be a little verbose. Um, I have a course that I just released on Egghead for refactoring a React app from JavaScript to TypeScript. Okay. Um, did I share that with you in the... Hold on. I think I did, but I'm going to have to share it. I'll just share it directly in the chat, Yeah. Um, since I can do that, too. I forgot I can do that. Um, give me just a minute. I got to get that link. Uh, in the meantime, um, uh, I am... Yeah, this, yeah. I'm going Go to uh, embiggen us, uh, and uh, we had a question earlier, just someone who wanted to see my excellent sweater again, so here it is in, in big, uh, as I arrange myself in the, the camera there, uh, maybe I'll get like extra close, uh, so yeah, um, big old T-Rex sweater, uh, T-Rex is wearing the same sweater, you gotta, um, okay. Recursive, I, I love your sweater, I really do. I. I think of myself as uh, with with my Santa hat as the young Santa from uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town that okay. that uh, claymation Santa movie because he's got a big red beard. Mine's a little smaller now, but um, <laughs> he's a he's a red bearded Santa in his youth. So I'm um, think of me as young Santa, even though I'm not that young. I'm getting kind of old, but anyway, um, I plugged my course. If you want to yes. learn TypeScript uh, in React, uh, go to check out my course to teach you how to refactor uh, JavaScript React app to TypeScript. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I tweet a bunch of nonsense. Sometimes I talk about tech. Sometimes I don't. Um, I don't know. That's that's all I got. Check out the Remix docs. I think Remix is great. If you have any questions, I'm around on uh, Discord, Twitter, anywhere. Remix, Find me. Remix has a Discord, questions. right? We do, yeah. Uh, if you go to remix.run, uh, there are links uh, to the Remix Discord if you want an invite there. It's all on the public. Um, I think it's under resources or something. I don't remember. Resources. It's somewhere. Uh, it's probably on the docs and not the home page. Uh, we should probably fix that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if we can find. There we go. Center community. There you go. Boom. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make it to do. I'm going to add that to the actual navigation. Uh, so 
uh, Marcos is asking if we would uh, talk about Rejui. We actually sort of have already together. What? Uh, that was when we did the tab component, right? Yeah, we did that in another stream. So if you yeah. got a link to that video, that would be a really good one to dive into Rejui. For those that don't know, Rejui um, was a it's a UI library. Uh, Ryan Florence initially created it. I started working on it and started maintaining it um, a couple years ago. I don't maintain it as much anymore just because time like i'm a busy fella mm -hmm. but um it's it, there's a pretty good community who's been using it for a long time and most of the components are fairly stable at this point so definitely uh if you're interested in that there was sort of thing check out read ui uh yeah and if you have any issues with it like i said i'm around ah uh the future of i imagine you'll you'll you might tweet about that perhaps uh to so follow i'm not i'm not gonna ask for uh future of like stuff right now um on stream but uh, reach out to to chance um yeah cool uh let's go ahead and call this done um so y'all uh while typically we stream every tuesday um i'm not going to be streaming next week because holiday reasons so i will see you in the new year with january 4th i, I actually just had to reschedule my january 4th stream so i'm going to figure out something good to do but if you enjoy things like accessibility and core web technologies. If you enjoy seeing guests such as Chance here, um, y'all should hit follow. You should also go to twitter.com uh, slash semanticsdev, uh, where I'll be tweeting all the updates for all the upcoming streams. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, I will see you in the new year. Thank you all so much for, for being here, joining me on this uh, this journey with Chance. Um, it's, been a, yeah. it's been great. Come it's hang out with us in Discord chat with me and my, all my really awesome co-workers and we'll, we'll see you on the internet awesome see thanks you ben around. bye y'all